So um, for you, those of you who don't know me, I'm an alum, I'm an endocrinologist at the U of A, I'm part of the Islet Transplant Program, and so it's my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Pepper for his talk today. But before we start, we'll do a land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada. His presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Also, thank you to Paladin, Estellas, and AstraZeneca for their support of the TI seminar series, and thank you all for attending today. And so, um, just a few words on the many accomplishments for Dr. Pepper. He was recruited to the Department of Surgery in the Division of Surgical Research at the University of Alberta as an assistant professor in 2018. His lab in the Alberta Diabetes Institute examines the underlying mechanisms that govern pancreatic beta cell survival and function post-transplant with the ultimate goal of developing and refining islet replacement therapies that could be a universal treatment for a broader range of people living with type 1 diabetes. His studies range from in vitro models to clinical transplants, including developing cell transplant technologies without immunosuppression, improving the function of pancreatic beta cell grafts, and translating alternative beta cell sources into an unlimited supply of insulin producing cells. He has published more than 40 manuscripts and four book chapters related to islet biology, immunology, and beta cell transplantation. And recently, Dr. Pepper was awarded a Canadian Research Chair in Cell Therapies for Diabetes and was previously awarded the JDRF International Career Development Award. And so without further ado, Dr. Pepper. So also thank you to the ATI and the organizing committee for this opportunity to share some of the collaborative research uh, endeavors with uh, Dr. Corbett's lab and our uh, philosophy or our uh, our techniques of enhancing transplant function through islet graft targeted uh, drug delivery. So I do have some conflicts of interest to declare. I am uh, on the scientific advisory board from Encelin. It's a device company in San Francisco looking at uh, places to, to house insulin producing cells, as well as a co-founder of Transcyto Therapeutics, where we're trying to create GMP grade uh, insulin producing cells, uh, both of which are not relevant to today's talk. So over the next 40 minutes or so, uh, I'd like to have a, a, a brief uh, objectives that hopefully we can all gain from, from today's talk. Uh, and, and namely, just look at the current status of beta cell replacement therapies uh, for the management of type 1 diabetes, outline some of the uh, facing challenges to the therapy, and then outline some of our advancements uh, and the impacts of targeting uh, the islet graph localized delivery platforms. Oh, sorry, I should watch this. Uh, I, we're all probably sick of the word pandemic, uh, but I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up uh, as the, the fact remains that diabetes is still a global pandemic. Uh, it is rising at an alarming rate, uh, almost 700 million people by 2045, uh, and it increases over 5% annually for reasons we don't fully understand. And it relates to about 10% of the population in Canada are afflicted by type 1 diabetes. So well over 300,000 individuals live uh, with this daily burden. And historically, there's uh, really been one main uh, state treatment for the management of type 1 diabetes for over 100 years since its discovery and implementation for clinical use, exogenous insulin still remains the go-to route. Now, there's been some advancements, of course, with uh, the continuous glucose monitor, and these are tethered to insulin pumps. But when we look at, the, at these artificial pancreas's ability to restore glucose homeostasis, we're still behind the curve. We're not quite in a physiological range, which would be in gray. So after implementation, there is some benefits, but by no means we are not recapitulating the control that uh, we see with the native pancreas. An alternative stra strategy is through transplantation, whether through pancreas or in our hands, islet transplantation. And it starts with a precious cadaveric human donor, where 2% of the pancreas mass that is responsible for endocrine function is isolated. Uh, these are the islets of Langerhans through a chemical and mechanical digestion process. It's therefore they're, uh, subsequently purified through a collagenase purification step 
and the IELTS are subsequently infused into the portal vein of the recipient and hopefully the embolize in the sinusoids of the liver can sense glucose and secrete insulin. And we can look at the amazing impact this uh, transplant has had on restoring uh, carbohydrate control to patients living with type 1 diabetes. We can see it at continuous glucose monitor trace of this individual before transplant, and we can see large fluxes of hyperglycemia, but more concerning are these periods of low, so low that the continuous glucose monitor cannot read um, the blood sugar levels. And this becomes very problematic with the individuals that are hypoglycemic unaware, and there could be deadly complications associated with this low blood sugar. However, nine months post-transplant, we can see the, the restoration of, of glucose homeostasis in this individual. When we look at the long-term follow-up, and this is a synthesis of the data collected here in Edmonton, uh, Dr. Shapiro's program by far is the most active clinical center in the world. And we can see that we have long-term graph survival, um, up to 20 years, half of the graphs have survived. And the hallmark of that is the C-peptide positive in the circulation of these uh, transplant recipients. However, when we look at insulin independence, we do see uh, attrition over time. Despite having around 100% insulin independent rates after the first year, there's some slow graph uh, decline and it's not quite durable. So this is a lot of area where we can hopefully intervene and have more durable function and, and attenuate some of the graph attrition that we see long-term. When we look at the, the synthesis of the evidence for a five-year follow-up, islet transplantation is probably by far one of the safest transplants. Uh, patient survival is greater than 95% at five years. There's a complete abrogation of she or severe hypoglycemic events, 95% of these patients at five years. Insulin independence rings at five years can uh, vary between 30 and 60%. There is a reduction of about 70% on exogenous insulin use. And then the optimal glycemic control is achieved in about 60% of individuals at five years. And this is typically defined as having a hemoglobin A1C of less than 7%. However, the results are highly dependent on the center's experience. There's a lot of tacit knowledge that goes into islet isolations and transplantation. Uh, so it really the center uh, experience is critical for for long-term success. When we look at the patient inclusion, uh, most of these pa patients have a severe hypoglycemic event at least one per year. And this is also combined with a maladaptive behavior. So extreme fear, fear of their hypoglycemia. A lot don't have a uh, driver's license. They can't go to their, their kids' soccer games. So it is a really uh, uh, impactful on their quality of life. These individuals also have a very high hemoglobin A1C, despite uh, optimal um, therapies with exogenous insulin. And their time in hypoglycemic range is quite concerning. It's over 5%, and there can be uh, deadly complications associated with that. And they have very high uh, glycemic liability, so large fluxes in hyperglycemic, uh, glycemia and hypoglycemia. So as a result, uh, islet transplantation really is like a fourth line therapy when all else has failed. So when all exogenous insulin uh, regimes have, have not uh, allowed these patients to have uh, good uh, glucose management, islet transplantation is offered. And that really only represents about 5 to 10% of patients living with type 1 diabetes uh, fulfill the strict criteria, namely to do to the risks associated with lifelong anti-rejection drugs. So despite its conceptual uh, simplicity, islet transplantation has really garnered a lot of attention and attraction, uh, but we're, we're close, but we're, again, we're so far away as this article has articulated. We still have to overcome the beta cell source limitations. We do have poor engraftment, at least acutely post-transplant, we have a lack of oxygen and a lot of inflammatory processes acutely post-transplant. And then we still have to uh, deal with the underlying alloimmunity, like all transplants. But individuals living with type 1 diabetes are also an interesting patient population because they have an underlying autoimmunity. So they'll also attack the beta cells that we uh, are transplanting. 
So taken together, the majority of the islets are destroyed within hours to days when infused into the portal vein up to about 70% due to inflammatory responses when the islets are bathed in blood. As a result, we require at least two donors per recipient to achieve insulin independence. And then there's the risks of lifelong whole body uh, immunosuppression and yeah, um, the iatrotropic uh, complications such as malignancy and cancers that can come along uh, with lifelong immunosuppression. So for most patients living with type 1 diabetes, the risks of the immunosuppression don't outweigh the benefits, especially if they have uh, relatively good control on a little bit of exogenous insulin. So there are many hurdles before beta cell replacement therapies can become the mainstay treatment. When we're looking at beta cell sources, as well as uh, graft survival, the need for lifelong immune suppression, and there's been a lot uh, of, of clinical trials recently of encapsulating uh, the beta cells within uh, macro encapsulated devices, but there's issues with chronic fibrosis and walling off uh, these modalities. But nevertheless, there's been some wonderful progress in stem cell biology and stem cell um, derived islets. And there's clinical trials going on here in North America and specifically in, in Edmonton. And one of these trials is through the Viasite group. Uh, their first trials were these PEC direct or PEC, sorry, in caps, in cap studies. And PEC stands for the pancreatic endoderm cells. So these are stem cell derived islet like cells that are about stage four in differentiation. So they do require a time of in vivo maturation before they can adequately sense uh, glucose and secrete insulin. So they are still immature cells. But when these cells are placed within an encapsulated device, there is the thought that there is no immunosuppression required. Uh, and while it was beneficial in rodent models, when we went to humans, we could say we could see that most of these devices walled off in collagen uh, and strangled the cells. Uh, insulin producing cells within the devices. So as a subsequent follow-up, there's a PEC direct study, this is a VCO2 study, where essentially the same device is perforated, where direct vascularization can happen to allow the cells to survive. However, a consequence of this is that now the recipient needs systemic immunosuppression because they are directly vascularized. And these are ongoing in Canada as well and here in Edmonton. And then more recently, there's the PEC uh, QT studies, and these are now hypoimmunogenic stem cell derived islets where they've knocked down uh, beta 2 microglobulin and knocked in immune modulating uh, proteins such as PDL1 and HLAE to hopefully suppress the NK cells. This modality also has direct vascularization, and the thought that creating somewhat immune isolating or privileged uh, cells that we will not require uh, anti rejection drugs. So some of the synthesis of these early trials were put out a couple of years ago from Edmonton, looking at the VCO2 products. So these are uh, sentinel graphs within uh, the subcutaneous area in patients. And one year post-transplant, uh, you could see that there was about 63% of the devices did have insulin expression. And looking at the histology, uh, there's very little to no CD3 cells within these devices. They had nice vascularization with CD34. However, most of the cells were glucagon positive and some were insulin positive. So at least show the proof of concept that these cells, these pancreatic endoderm cells can survive within these devices under immunosuppression. There's been subsequent follow-ups with different approaches of stem cell derived islets. Instead of transplanting at the pancreatic endoderm stage, differentiating these uh, progenitors into a more uh, bona fide beta cell, so more of a stage seven or stage eight. Uh, and Doug Melton and Tim Kiefer in Canada have been really championing this field. Uh, and Dr. Melton has created a company called Sema Therapeutics, which was bought out by Vertex for the clinical translation of their stem cell derived islets. Uh, and they have a bit more of a, a resemblance of bona fide uh, primary beta cells. So Vertex and Viasite have actually merged uh, last year. So these two, uh, two giants in the field have come together uh, and hopefully this will help uh, spur along more clinical trials and, and hopefully overcome the issue of precious cadaveric human donors. And this, these could be a, a surrogate for human tissues.
And just this year at the ADA, uh, Vertex announced some positive results for their first trial. And what they did, which is different than, than Viasite, they took their SC beta cells, the VX880 cells, and instead of encapsulating them into a device, they infuse these cells into the portal vein, just like the clinical route of islet transplantation. And this past June, they had a, uh, an update on this trial, and two of the patients with one-year follow-up had met their primary endpoint, which is the elimination of severe hypoglycemic events, as well as having hemoglobin A1C below seven. And additionally, these two individuals um, became insulin independent one year post transplant. So it's the first time that stem cell derived islets has been demonstrated to restore um, insulin independence in patients. So it is really promising field that these stem cell derived islets could be a surrogate to human islets and, and potentially would be an unlimited source of transplantable insulin producing cells. And Dr. Reichman had presented this data at ADA just this year, but one of the complications or one of the limitations is that this approach still requires systemic immunosuppression. So this is the, somewhat the ethos behind our approach. So our overall objective is to broaden the application of beta cell transplantation for individuals living with type 1 diabetes as they are hindered by lifelong uh, systemic immunosuppression. And we aim to overcome this barrier through exploring novel uh, localized immunomodulatory technologies and test their efficacy in delaying islet transplant rejection. So our overall hypothesis really is that these localized drug delivery of immunosuppression uh, through FDA approved PLGA microparticles will prolong islet allograft function. And the islet allograft we hope could be primary cadaveric human donors, stem cell derived islets, and potentially xenogenic sources. And this is just a, a snapshot of all the immunosuppressive agents that have been used in clinical trials to, uh, to help protect these beta cells. And they can range from anti-inflammatories to uh, T cell uh, inactivators. So our first approach, when we looked at developing microparticles or mesels to deliver localized uh, drugs, uh, we looked at dexamethasone. We know it is a potent anti-inflammatory. It's also very economical, especially in, in a proof of concept. Uh, so a lot of these studies have been championed by a wonderful uh, research associate in Dr. Corbett and my lab, uh, Dr. Peru Kupan. And what he has developed is a, a way to encapsulate a drug in PLGA. So he uses a polymer and he can mix this with a drug of interest. In this case, it's dexamethasone at various concentrations. Uses an emulsification technique with an organic solvent. And we can spin these uh, microparticles to get various sizes. So essentially, we can encapsulate these uh, drugs within these bubbles, these microparticles, that will degrade over time through hydrolysis and release the drug of interest. And we can play around the chemistry uh, to fine tune their release. And we use PLGA because it is an FDA approved reference material for clinical use uh, for injection as microparticles. It's also biocompatible. And we also want it to be biodegradable. We know there's a lot of hindrance with foreign tissue um, long term in the body. So we want to reduce any uh, fibrotic overgrowth and make sure this is just a temporal uh, release of drug. So we can make these microparticles with various drug concentrations, depending on our drug target dosing. We can also play around with the ratio of PLGA to PVA to uh, have different release kinetics. And in this case, with dexamethasone, we looked at 1 to 10 milligrams uh, of dex, and we can see that when we have less drug, we have slower elution. When we have more drug, we have faster dilution. And we think we, it's because we have some amorphic microparticles, so that increases surface area and allows hydrolysis to happen a little quicker. Again, we can see the cumulative release. When we have more drug, we can release uh, all the drug within, say, uh, a week. But if we have less drug present, we can have more of a sustained release. So for our uh, approach in our, in our first uh, cohort of transplants, we were trying to target about a 50% release for three weeks. We wanted a bit more sustained release of dexamethasone, and we were targeting about 50 micrograms total of dex to deliver to these recipients. So our, our typical murine transplant models will transplant 
500 islets into a recipient that has received streptocytosin. And this is a drug that chemically induces diabetes and targets the beta cells, so the animals will become diabetic. So we mix the murine islets with the microparticles. And we can, this is a, a representation within the tubing that we use, PE tubing. We have islets and microparticles and these cells. And then we, we can see on a scanning electron micrograph, this is one islet with some microparticles attached to the islet itself. And then there's subsequently fused underneath the kidney capsule. So before we do any uh, allogeneic testing, we want to make sure the localized drug delivery uh, is not deleterious to the islets themselves in vivo. So we do a syngenic transplant where we put the same uh, donor into the same recipient. And we can see when we have islets alone, these animals are diabetic until uh, the graft kicks in and they have uh, completely normal glucose homeostasis until we remove the graft. So we can perform a nephrectomy, we can remove that kidney, the animal will go hyperglycemic again. We can then therefore say that we have graft dependent euglycemia and we see nice insulin and glucagon underneath the kidney capsule. So when we looked with dex releasing microparticles, we could see that when they're co-localized, they, the animals still uh, function very well. There's no hindrance to graft uh, function until we remove the kidney as well. And then when we look histologically, we can see beautiful islets in close proximity to these microparticles, uh, which have asterisks here, staining again nicely for insulin and glucagon. And when we challenge these mice after transplant through uh, a glucose bolus, an IPGTT, we can see they have a very rapid clearance of, of glucose uh, in response to this glucose challenge compared to islets alone. And we have a, a, a nice population of insulin and glucagon. So we were quite confident that the co-localization of drugs, because some of them can be diabetogenic, does not hinder in vivo function, at least syngenetically. So our next step was, well, will it prevent or delay islet allograft rejection? So we know we can have 100% euglycemic uh, rates in a syngenetic model, but when we looked at transplanting now bulb C islets into a C57, uh, so this is an HLA mismatch, uh, we could see that empty microparticles, so just islets alone with no drug, they reject within about two weeks. And when we use DEX releasing microparticles, we slightly delayed rejection by about a week to two weeks, but as a monotherapy, it wasn't enough. Historically in the lab, we use a CTLA-4, so this is a co-stimulatory blockade molecule, and we give it on four days, four different injections on day of transplant, two, four, and six. And we can see using this protocol, we have about 40% of the mice are euglycemic at 60 days post-transplant. But when we combine that with dex-releasing microparticles, we we're able to potentiate the graft function. We had over 80% of the recipients were euglycemic at 60 days post-transplant. So it was a nice combination therapy. And we were curious, was it the co-localization that was important, or was it just that these mice were receiving dexamethasone? So we performed a series of contralateral transplants. So we put islets on the right kidney and the dex-releasing microparticles on the left kidney. And, and we also gave CTLA-4IG for those first uh, six days. And what we could see in this cohort of animals is that they responded very similar to just the CTLA-4 group. So they didn't have that added benefit of having the co-localization. So we really believe that having the drugs at the site of transplant has profound long-term effects, even though the drugs only release for about 30 days. When we again we look at glucose tolerance testing in these recipients, we could see compared to just our standard CTLA-4 treatment, we had an improved glucose clearance uh, in response to a metabolic challenge when we had dextrally microparticles uh, in these allograft recipients 60 days post-transplant. The question is why, how, uh, we, we believe that when we look at seven days post-transplant, so acute transplant, we, we're changing the milieu within that transplant environment. We can see a reduction in intragraft cytokine, so specifically interferon and, and IL-10 uh, in these graphs when we combine uh, dexamethasone and CTLA-4IG uh, co-localization. What was interesting is what was driving this long-term function. Uh, so we looked at graphs of recipients that uh, had reached our endpoints 
And when we looked at, at the, the graphs themselves, we could see that in our microparticle and CTLA-4 recipients, we had a higher total endocrine mass present. So we believe we were protecting the graphs better than just a, a short core systemic immunosuppression protocol. And when we looked at the, the graphs, we also saw a significant increase in FOXP3T regulatory cells. So we believe that these are, are some of the champion cells that are, are allowing us to have long-term uh, allograph function when co-localized with DEX uh, secreting microparticles. So that was great for a, a proof of concept. We were really happy with that. But again, dexamethasone by itself is by no means a, a monotherapy. So this past summer, sorry, uh, Dr. Kuban, we just published this paper where we also used a, 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 a microparticle formulation, but now encapsulated a more potent immunosuppressive agent, cyclosporin A. And we use cyclosporin A because yes, it is a calcineurin inhibitor, so it has anti-T cell proliferation uh, capabilities, but it also has a cyclophilin D stabilization properties, which we believe is important for the metabolic potency and the mitochondrial potency of the islets. So in, in this uh, approach, Peru refined our emulsification procedures and the organic solvents uh, to improve the encapsulation efficiency of these microparticles, and now they house dexamethasone, and it has more functional groups, so it's a bit easier to encapsulate. Uh, and our in vivo release kinetics, we're only secreting about 0.1 micrograms of drug per day. So it's a very, very slow release of, of drug that's being secreted. And using this modified uh, procedure to prepare the microparticles, we could uh, reduce the size. So we're only about 10 microns in diameter in comparison to our DEX releasing microparticles, which are about 50 microns. And this has practical implications. We want to decrease the amount of transplant volume. So the smaller the particles, the less transplant volume we have. And then it also gives us an opportunity to combine multiple microparticles together in a transplant platform. And you can also see our encapsulation efficiency increased quite a bit from about 15% to about 74%. Again, we started off with doing our syngeneic islet transplants because calcineurin inhibitors do have diabogenic actions, just like DEX. We could see that with islets alone transplanted, the animals become uh, euglycemic until we perform a nephrectomy. Again, we have nice insulin and glucagon staining. And then when we combine islets with microparticles that secrete uh, cyclosporin A, again, we can see a wonderful correction of diabetes in mice until we nephrectomize these animals. Again, nice glucose and, and uh, glucagon and insulin staining, similar to the islets alone. And we can see the co-localization of the microparticles right in the islet graph under the kidney capsule. So we were happy that we, we weren't hindering uh, function, so we moved on to our allograph model. And in this model, similar to what we did before, our empty microparticles in orange rejected within about two weeks. But when we had cyclosporin eluding microparticles, we could see that we significantly delayed rejection by about a month. However, it was not by, alone by itself, we didn't have long-term allograft function. When we use our typical CTLA-4IG and we kept the animals out beyond 200 days, we had about 30% of these animals were euglycemic. However, when we combined with cyclosporin eluding microparticles in this approach, we had around 60% of these animals, 200 days post-transplant, that were completely euglycemic. So just having that short course dexamet or sorry, short course cyclosporin seemed to have profound impacts on long-term durability of these allografts in mice. When we looked at acute transplants, we noticed that these cyclosporin eluding microparticles really reduced immune infiltrate. So we, when we look at islets alone, um, compared to the microparticles alone, and then our combination approach, we can see a significant reduction in CD4 positive cells, CD8 positive cells, and CD68 macrophages within the graphs. So we really think that these microparticles can fine tune the, the transplant milieu, making it an optimal or more uh, favorable niche for islets to survive at least acutely post-transplant, and then hopefully we can increase uh, regulatory cells to have long-term durable function. And this is, forgive me for a bit of a busy slide, but just to recapitulate or, or re-emphasize this 
this thought that we're really changing the inflammatory milieu acutely post-transplant. We did have also a reduction of pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, and, and chemokines within these acute grafts when we combine microparticles uh, with CTLA-4 IG or even just microparticles alone. And we do have a reduction in some of our T cell markers uh, through PCR. When we looked at our long-term uh, post-transplant graph, so this is now 214 days post-transplant, we did see beautiful islets with very little um, immune infiltrate within these graphs, especially in our, our CSA microparticles. And where we did see areas inflammation, when we had the CTLA-4 and cyclosporin highlighted with these arrows, we saw a lot of FOXB3 uh, T regulatory cells, similar to what we saw with dexamethasone. So we do believe that this is one of the mechanisms that is conferring long-term protection in these allograft recipients. One of the questions we had, well, are we just creating systemic tolerance or immunosuppression by giving cyclosporin? So what we did is a cohort of skin transplants. And what we did in this study is these animals were normal glycemic 100 days post-transplant. And we did a series of skin, skin transplants. So in the dash line, these are C57 mice of the recipients, and we put our donor skin. So this is bulb C skin. And we could see that skin would reject within about 10 days. But when we had recipients of an islet islograph with bulb C islets, plus our microparticles and CTLA-4 IG, we could see that the skin did reject, but it was significantly delayed. So it, it wasn't that these were just donor-specific tolerance. There was something going on in the graph that prevented um, the rejection of these islets long term, but allowed them to reject the donor skin. And when we compare this to a third party skin graph, so again, when we have our C57 recipients and we put a C3H skin, so a mismatch, the skin is rejected again within 10 days. And when we have our long term functional islet transplant recipients and we give a third party graph, they're rejected quite rapidly. So we don't believe we have this systemic immunosuppression environment. We have this operational tolerance, this tolerance just to the islet graph itself. Something's going on in the transplant environment conferring that protection. And we can look at the skin to kind of uh, help reinforce this. We always do a syngenetic control, so a technical control of, of matched skin. When we have our donor islet skin, uh, about 21 days, they became rejected in chronic in comparison to a third party transplant, which was rejected around 12 days. So we don't have that systemic immunosuppression just localized to the transplant environment itself. Just a, a brief video of our, our recent transplants where we transplanted 10,000 uh, neonatal pig islets with five milligrams of DEX and 10 milligrams of cyclosporin. And hopefully in the future, we'll use uh, rapamycin now. So I'm just implanting the PE tubing that contains those cells through the lumen of the indwelling catheter, which uh, then I'll remove and we can infuse the cells into that new, uh, newly vascularized uh, tissue just underneath the skin. So this is the catheter that would have been in place for approximately uh, one month. And when we collected the histology, uh, also one month post-transplant, we stained the grafts for the neonatal porcine islets. And because they're somewhat like stem cell derived islets, they're not fully mature, uh, they do not stain for insulin very well, uh, but they do stain for chromogran and A, a neuroendocrine marker. So when we looked at our histology from some of these transplants, four weeks post, four weeks post transplant, we could see these beautiful um, chromogran and A staining of these islets within this vascularized lumen. And we could see at four weeks still some microparticles present within these graphs. And one of the big take home uh, messages here is that we did have graph survival with no immunosuppression. These are just sentinel graphs and non-diabetic pigs, but it's giving us a, a platform where we can scale this uh, approach to potentially human use uh, and refine our, our drug concentrations and, and candidates to hopefully protect allograft uh, survival in large animals. So there's still much work to be done, which is fun and exciting. Uh, we're, we're, we're hopeful to use a multi-drug uh, delivery platform, so combining multiple drugs, either single microparticles or in combination, and also playing around with the chemistry to better tether the microparticles to the islets themselves. 
We're also constantly trying to optimize, I should say I, but it's really Dr. Kupan who's optimizing encapsulation efficiency in the pharmacokinetics of the microparticles, depending on when we want a certain drug released and at what time. And we're scaling to more uh, potent immunosuppressive agents and looking in the humanized mouse models to protect now against human induced islet graft rejection. And we're hopeful to combine this with stem cell derived beta cells as well as scaling to uh, large animal models. So we think there's some potential impacts that we can, by using this approach, improve the engraftment and function of cell therapies. We can explore this with new sites and also different uh, mechanisms, not just immunosuppressive agents, but also attenuating uh, cell death through different cell death, death pathways, which we can provide those inhibitors. And we can reduce the number uh, of hopefully donors required to achieve insulin independence. We hope to reduce and potentially eliminate the requirement for lifelong immunosuppression, therefore reducing the risks of the procedure. And by doing so, we hope that we can broaden the spectrum of patients that are eligible to receive a life-changing cell transplant. And then again, hopefully transplant, translate these findings to alternative cell sources, especially the stem cell derived islets and potentially xenogenic uh, derived islets as well. So I'd like to thank uh, my team, of course, um, as well as the members of, of the Corbett Lab. It's been a wonderful collaboration. I should probably update a lab photo as uh, this was obviously was during the <laughs> pandemic time. And really like to thank uh, the human islet sources. So Dr. Patrick McDonald, Dr. Kim and, and Shapiro, the clinical islet lab for allowing us the opportunity to work with primary human islet tissues. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the OPOs the donors and their families for giving this wonderful gift to, to work with uh, human tissue. And, and of course, our funding agencies as well. So thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions you may have. I'm not sure if I, to if I totally understood the mouse model you presented, but if I did, I'm wondering if you looked for MHC antibodies as part of like when there was a lack of, uh, you knew it was gonna be an HLA related question, I'm sure. <laughs> so, uh, or AVO, I guess you could have gone either way. But um, anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if you if you look for the presence or development of HLA or I guess in mouse MHC antibodies. No, that's a wonderful question. No, we haven't. So they are mismatched at bulb C to, uh, to C57, but we haven't looked at what antibodies are driven. Uh, and that would be something that we would, we would love to do. And we just have a CHR grant that we're hopeful to tease out some more mechanistic approaches. We see some T regulatory cells, but I doubt that's the only reason. So it would be nice to see what sort of antibodies have been down regulated with a localized approach. So maybe we yeah. can uh, leverage your expertise and, and help us elucidate. Some. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm like all human all the time, but I'll try to help. <laughs> yeah. well, perhaps I, I we'll guess... to our humanized mouse models. Uh, that might be an approach, although I don't know if they would create antibodies, something that maybe the panels would, would work on. Yeah, I mean, along the same vein, do you know um, all of the, like with the work that's, and I've forgotten now the cell line, you had it on your slide, it was a something 088 or the, uh, what is it? The one that's used by, um, uh, by in the cell, uh, oh my goodness, the companies that you presented who have who'd recently published. Do you know if they have included that in their presentation? I kind of took a quick look while you were talking, but you probably know better than I do. Oh, we, I haven't seen any data presented on autoantibodies or, or donor-specific antibodies, and I'm not quite sure the source of the VX880 cells. Uh, I yeah. know for Viracite, there was CYT49, that was the parent material, but I'm not sure with the, uh, the Vertex uh, parent yeah. material. When I search for like that cell name and HLA, it doesn't seem to really be very illuminating. So maybe it's still a secret. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank and you so, so much. It was a great talk. Thank you, Anne. And I'll invite Mitchell Wagner to ask your question. If you don't mind. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thanks for the, the awesome talk, Dr. Pepper. Um, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on why you chose to inject the beta cells into the kidney capsule rather than the portal vein, which is, as you said, done in patients. Yeah, wonderful question. So uh, one of the reasons why we do it is for co-localization. So these microparticles can stay closely, pretty packed underneath the kidney capsule. So we can guarantee for some degree of confidence that we have the islets right with the microparticles themselves, because they do stick to some degree, but it is by no means like a covalent bond of the islets to the microparticles. 
If we put them into the portal vein, we feel that most of them would probably end up in the lungs. Uh, but there is, it's a very good point because there is a group, uh, Dr. Shireen Forbes in Edinburgh, that is using a similar approach to uh, precondition the liver by using microparticles and tethering galactose on the outside and leveraging the ASG PR uh, receptors to be able to, I think they use fibroglass growth factor to increase vascularization post-transplant. So uh, it's not to say that we can't, we would just have to change the chemistry of the outside of the particles to be taken up by the lumen and endothelial cells uh, within the liver. So as a first proof of concept, we use the kidney capsule. It's the gold standard in uh, preclinical islet transplantation because uh, we can nephrectomize the animal, we can prove graft-dependent euglycemia. We can't do that with the liver. And then there's an, also an issue of, of scalability. When we look at the size of a human islet versus a mouse islet, they're very similar in diameter. But when we look at the sinusoids of a mouse liver versus a human liver, uh, the mouse uh, sinusoids are, are quite small, the capillaries are quite small. So we do have some technical issues with the portal vein transplants in mice. We have these uh, big embolisms, downstream steatosis and complications in the portal vein in mice. So there's some anatomical considerations to think about as well. But we're hopeful that by leveraging and maybe teaming up with Dr. Forbes group, we can combine our approaches to target the intrahepatic site. Um, that's kind of a tie into a question I had was, so it, it sounds like then you can't just give these microparticles out, out the islets. So you think they should be delivered together? Like, is there any chance you could rescue or rejecting graft with just microparticles or? Right, right. That's a very good question. So based on our contralateral transplants, we think that the co-localization is, is very important to uh, kind of prime the site to be uh, an optimal niche, uh, so to speak. But if we're looking at a portal rate route where you have access again, and you could target either the islets or specifically endothelium, that uh, that could be something to re rescue, or at least maybe not even rescue, but just to give some inter uh, localized intervention to the islet graph. So I think the portal, here, that's a great point, the portal circulation would be good yeah. in that case. Some of our other modalities, like a kidney capsule underneath the skin, once the there's nothing permanent there, so it's hard to go back and, and target. It becomes uh, integrated into a vascularized collagen. But if we had something open to the circulation, then yeah, I think there's conceivably possible to do that. Um, let's just see if there's anything else. If there is, I might just ask one more. Oh, oh, oh wait, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah, excellent talk, Andrew. Thank you. Um, so I was just wondering, do you think the the mechanism of like or the reason like the reason that the the combo of the rapa and the microparticle works better compared to the cyclosporin is because of the cell that's, that is caused by the cyclosporin, or what do you think? Ooh. Yeah, that's a good question. So whether it's the cell death induced by the drug or it's just protecting the immune the immune system itself, I think the rapa is just a, a more potent uh, T anti T cell proliferation. Um, drug, uh, based on our syngenaic models, we don't think the localization has any deleterious effects on the islets themselves, whether it be cyclosporin or rapamycin. So I think just the rapamycin, at least in, in most models, is just a more important uh, inhibitor of T-cell proliferation. And, and um, that's why we're seeing a, a better response. But we're hopeful to tease that a little bit more uh, as to why. I didn't allude to this now, but we've done some nanostring uh, acute transplants looking at like broad spectrum gene profiling uh, with and without the microparticles and rapamycin to see what uh, what is upregulated and what's downregulated in, in the broad strokes, not just the islets, but in the immune system as well. So. And just like a, a follow-up question, like a, you think like a, maybe a, like, um, a single cell uh, understanding of like what happens within like the islets, like with the combos and, or have you done that? or? Right. We, we haven't done any like single cell RNA-seq or, or attack-seq on that. Uh, so we're looking at just broad uh, nanostrings. So looking at just gene profiling in the grafts themselves, both pre-transplant and post-transplant. Uh, and hopefully that'll let us know what pathways are upregulated. And we can look at some beta cell specific pathways. And if we do see that it's the beta cell or the islets, the endocrine cells, that are really being changed and not just the immune cells, then maybe we could suss out a little bit more on a single cell mm -hmm. uh, level uh, specifically for the endocrine cells. So that's a great point. Thank you.